So I'd like to get started, and as you can see on the screen there, the beginning, uh, the topic for today is about stress and how it affects us and how to change that. And it's really important to understand this. I'm going to go over some biochemical things in the uh, presentation today that uh, talks about our stress response, why we have stress, um, what its purpose is, why it can become a problem with us today as opposed to uh, how things were, you know, 10,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago. And then we're going to talk about some solutions. And those solutions are not just vitamins or herbs to take. Those can be helpful parts of this. But ultimately, if we are responding stress-wise to things in, in an unhealthy way, it's because we have learned to interact with our environment in an unhealthy way. And I'm going to talk about ways to, uh, to change that also. So Let's begin. And again, just want to remind you, if you have questions, just type it right into that box. Um, I said, let's get started. And I, I guess I should introduce myself. For those of you who are not familiar with me, my name is Brian Sanderoff. I am a regularly trained pharmacist. I used to stand behind the counter and do that count poor lick stick type and gripe thing that pharmacists do. I actually owned two pharmacies in downtown Baltimore once upon a time. And after having been in my stores for a while, I wanted to evaluate how well I was really helping my, my patients. And, and lo and behold, I came to discover that I was not helping my patients for chronic disease at, in the way that I really wanted to. And what I kind of found out through exploration is that what we do in medicine for all the chronic diseases of aging is not fix problems. All we do is turn down volume. The body is talking to us with a symptom that we may call a disease like diabetes or cardiovascular disease or high blood pressure, depression even, and um, osteoporosis. And what we do in medicine is we turn the volume down. We don't listen. And so uh, uh, 25 years ago in my career, I decided to try to do things a different way, did a radio show. Um, actually, I, I do a radio show now that um, airs every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. in Arizona, uh, and Arizona doesn't do the daylight savings time, so 10 a.m. is like uh, West Coast time now. And so you can tune into that if you happen to be in uh, uh, anywhere in the southern half of Arizona. But you also can listen to the radio show live right from our website. And then we also record as a podcast every one of the radio shows, and all of those are on the website as well. And so lots of good uh, opportunity to talk about a lot of different topics and, and information. Um, and basically what I did was say, you know what, I don't want to really be a part of giving people these medicines anymore. I don't want to just turn down the volume. I want to find what the problems are, what the root, because if we can do that, then those things that we call diseases in Western medicine have the potential and the tendency to go away. And today's topic, stress, is a big part of this because stress and how we respond to things plays a very big role in how our genes will end up expressing themselves, meaning that your genes could express themselves in a positive way, in a negative way, and stress and us responding to stress in a, um, in a less than optimal way is uh, uh, one of the main reasons why our genes likely express themselves in a negative way. And this is one of the reasons why diseases run in families, because we have genetic tendencies that we get from our parents. But what do we also get from our parents? All of our diet and lifestyle habits and also how we deal with stress. And that's why we see things running in families. So hopefully that's a good, um, that's a good way of kind of looking at things uh, as a background. And so let's go ahead and hit it. So what is the purpose of stress. I mean, you know, stress wasn't created uh, in our bodies just to bug us. It, it actually has some very important um, uh, implications, and it actually is life-saving. So, you know, when we were cavemen and a saber-toothed tiger jumped in the cave, um, our body would go into what we call fight or flight, and certain physiological changes would happen that are mediated by some very powerful chemical mediators in the body that allow us to better uh, survive that encounter, whatever that stressful encounter would be. So here are the biochemical um, changes that can happen when 
we're under stress. And so something happens. We interpret it as a life-threatening situation. Like, again, we were cavemen and a saber-toothed tiger jumped in the cave. So, number one, heart rate goes up and blood pressure elevates and blood sugar goes up and blood lipids change. Cholesterol levels go up and the immune system gets affected by this. Now, the reason is because when we are presented with a life-threatening situation, all of these biochemical changes that you see in front of you are designed to help us withstand that interaction better. Heart rate and blood pressure go up. Blood is shunted away from the gut and to our muscles and brain so that we can run or fight. Blood sugar goes up because we need extra fuel immediately to be able to um, you know, run or fight and then to repair from whatever damage is going to happen from that encounter. Same thing with our cholesterol. And our immune system actually gets buoyed by that experience. Again, the body in its wisdom, understanding that when we are um, in a life-threatening situation, it's likely that our immune system is going to have to be able to work harder to recover from that. So all of these biochemical changes that happen because of stress are life-preserving when we're presented with a, uh, a life-threatening situation. So there's a difference, though, between acute stress and chronic stress. So when the tiger leaves the cave, when we um, survive that encounter, then every one of those biochemical uh, changes comes back to our baseline. Blood pressure and heart rate go back. Blood starts to get shunted back to everywhere in the body, especially the gut. Our immune system normalizes. Our blood sugar normalizes. All of those things come back to normal. The problem is, is that today in our society, the way we live, that saber tooth tiger never leaves the cave. And then we get this phenomenon that we call chronic stress. And I am here to tell you that genetically speaking, this is a new phenomenon for us as a species. And our bodies are not geared to have those physiological changes keep lasting. And so what in the short term is a life-preserving process, in the long term becomes a life-altering process and it is one of the major reasons why we develop all of these things that in our medicine we call diseases, all of the chronic diseases of aging. And so this is what you know, we're going to address today, and, and it's important to understand that. So when you hear about stress or we talk about stress, oftentimes there's a negative connotation to that. And we say, oh, stress, oh, that's a bad thing. Well, the truth is, is that it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's a, it's a fact. And in the short term, our body's response to that stress is exactly what it's supposed to be. Unfortunately for many of us, our life circumstances – are such that we, inside of our heads, interpret it, not consciously, but we interpret circumstances as being life-threatening, and our body reacts just like when we were cavemen and that saber-toothed tiger jumped in the cave. And that is the root of a lot of our problems. And so hopefully we're going to talk about some strategies and some ways to look at that in a little bit uh, different way. So let's talk a little bit about biochemistry. So when you're under stress, you kick out the hormones of stress, adrenaline and cortisol. And these are the mediators that cause all of those other physiological changes to happen one way or another. And so these are the messengers. And those messengers come from our adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands sit right above your kidneys. And when we're under stress, that signal comes from our brain and some glands in our brain to our adrenals to kick out those mediators saying, uh-oh, here comes a life-threatening situation. You better do your thing. And then we had release adrenaline and cortisol. And, the, um, and then that, those are the ones that then cause the rest of those changes to happen. Elevated heart rate, um, you know, elevated blood pressure, a shunt in blood to what we need when we're in the middle of a, a life-threatening situation. Initially, our immune system is buoyed. But chronically, our immune system then gets burnt out, right? You want an example of that? How many people listening or that you know of have experienced getting shingles? 
So shingles is uh, an infection, a viral infection that's caused by the same virus that causes uh, chicken pox. So you get chicken pox when you're a kid, the virus never leaves your body, it just hangs out in the endings of the nerves throughout your body. And your immune system keeps a check on them. And then for some reason, the shingles, that virus comes out and has a party and it shows up as shingles, very painful. And um, what is it that causes that to happen? Well, almost everybody that I know of that's ever had shingles gets it when something stressful happened, a major life event, death of a spouse, retirement, moving, financial problems, problems with your kids, a major stress happens, and that stress causes the immune system at first getting void, but then getting dampened, and then the virus comes out and has a party. That's what shingles really is. So, again, your adrenals sit right above your kidneys. Well, what happens when you get too much cortisol? Well, it's not really too much. It's really too long of an exposure from cortisol, <clears throat> and all sorts of things change, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail. So... I also want to talk that I want to uh, share the, the thought that your adrenals are connected to the other glands in your body. And in fact, this is the case with every gland in your body. They're all connected to each other. They all communicate with each other and they all work in concert. And so, you know, in medicine, we have a tendency to look at one thing like the thyroid. And we say, OK, you got a problem with your thyroid and we treat the thyroid without understanding that other glands may actually be affecting thyroid function. And that's the case with the adrenals or that our treatment of the thyroid will affect other glands as well. We don't respect that well enough in medicine, and I think that that's been a shortcoming that we've had for a long time. So there's this thing that we call the HPA axis, and it's the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenals. So those are three very important glands, two in your brain, and then your adrenals, which sit right above your kidneys. They're all connected, and when you have a stress response it goes through all three of these glands. And so the recognition of a stressful event happens. The hypothalamus sends a message to the pituitary, which then sends a message to the uh, adrenals. And then the adrenals kick out their messenger to make those other physiological changes happen. And it's also important to know that this HPA axis affects thyroid function in a major way. So one of the things that we notice in people that are under chronic stress is that they have a tendency to have a sluggish thyroid and their metabolism tanks, meaning that they don't burn calories and they don't have energy like they used to. And usually in medicine, the first place that we look to treat that is the thyroid, not understanding that really it's the adrenals that are affecting thyroid function and that's where we should put our attention. And some of the evidence of that, and again, some of you in the audience right now may be able to verify this. I have a lot of patients who go to the doctor complaining of issues, energy, mood, sleep, and they do a blood test and they say the thyroid is not working right and they put you on a medicine for thyroid and you don't feel any better. The blood work will look better, but the symptoms haven't really gone away. That is a common occurrence. And when that happens, it's usually because it's not really the root of the problem. The root of the problem is adrenal function and thyroid and how, uh, I mean, and adrenals and how uh, uh, stress is affecting us. And then I also want to point out that thymus function is also affected. And the thymus is a gland that's right in the middle of your chest. And that is sort of like um, immune central. And so when we're under stress, thymus stops working properly, immune function stops working properly. And again, that, that's long term. All right. So I also like to point out to people that there's different stress types. It's a fancy way of saying that different people will respond to stress in different ways. And generally speaking, it's one of two ways. There are HPA over responders. And there are HPA under responders. And I see some heads shaking already in the virtual world that you get this and you understand this because um, you know that people uh, react differently. And there are some people that when they under stress, they get busy and nervous and anxious and they can't quiet their mind. 
and they have a tendency more towards anxiety. And then there's other people who we would consider to be under responders. And for them, they just get exhausted and they can't even muster a response to the stressful things anymore. And they have, may, have, may have more of a, a, a tendency to go towards depression instead of anxiety. And so the over responders are ones that when they get under stress, they can't sleep. Their mind is always racing or they wake up in the middle of the night worrying about, you know, what happened yesterday or what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and then the under responders, when they get under stress, they just want to crawl into bed and pull the covers over their head and sort of withdraw from the world. Now, I know that there are some people right now who are saying, well, wait a second. I might be both of those because there are times when I'm an over responder and times when I'm an under responder. And that's actually pretty common. It, it's, it's more common that someone that used to be an over responder is now an under responder. And what happens is, is that through chronic stress and not fixing the underlying issues and not putting attention to the adrenals, the result is, is that you get what we call adrenal burnout. And when that happens, you, um, you know, you can't even muster a response anymore. And so I, I work with people who now are just completely withdrawn who used to be under stress and used to be that typical type A personality. And so what they did is kind of burn themselves out. I also want to mention here, and it's not on the, uh, on the slide anywhere, but I want to mention that there actually is testing for this. If you want to do testing to see what uh, adrenal output and cortisol looks like. So cortisol is a very important hormone and it, helps get you up and moving in the morning. And so it's in the morning when your cortisol levels are the highest. And it's not just because of stress. It's a normal, uh, you know, brain chemical, a very important neurotransmitter that plays very important roles in the body otherwise. And so you can do testing to see what your cortisol levels are throughout the day and see if your response to things in life are um, normal or adequate. And you can see um, changes in what should be and what is on that testing. Now, my favorite way to do this testing is actually through saliva. And what we do is we have you spit into a tube on four different times during the day, morning when you first wake up, and then, you know, around noon, and then around six, and then bedtime. And what we should see is that the morning uh, tube, you contain the highest amounts of cortisol, and then you have a nice, uh, you know, drop as you go throughout the day, and at nighttime, your cortisol is supposed to be lowest, and that's part of what allows you to sleep. There are people who have no problem falling asleep, but in the middle of the night, they'll wake up for no apparent reason. Maybe their mind is racing, and like I said, maybe they've got worries or concerns, and that's what's working underneath the surface. Well, what's happening is they're getting a cortisol spike in the middle of the night when cortisol is supposed to be lowest, and that's what takes you out of the sleep state is that cortisol, just like in the morning, it's part of what wakes you up. And so I, you know, as far as the testing, you can go to your doctor and say, hey, I want that testing. And, and sometimes they'll do blood testing the same way. I don't find that as reliable. Uh, saliva cortisol is a much uh, more accurate indicator of what's going on in your body than blood cortisol, meaning that you could have cortisol in your blood um, show up but be bound to proteins where it, it isn't, um, it isn't use, usable by your body. And so, and plus also, you know, it's inconvenient to have your blood drawn at four different times during the, during the day, especially at bedtime. And so the, the saliva is the most reliable way to do it. Um, I don't usually do that sort of testing unless I'm getting um, frustrated with treatment with a patient who isn't getting better from their story, because usually we know what the, what the answer is and we know how stress is, you know, uh, affecting us. Um, but sometimes people want to see it in black and white and have that, that visual, you know, bells and whistles and all that kind of stuff. And so that testing, most insurance companies do not pay for that testing. And just the, the cortisol testing is probably, I don't know, $130, $140 to do. And so, you know, you may want to consider doing that if you, if you like to have that information. But usually people understand and know the answers right away from that. Okay, so... I also want to let you know that there is a questionnaire that I use and I have people fill out that allows us to know whether they're an over responder or an under responder by answering certain questions in these specific sections. And so that questionnaire is available for download off of our website. It's absolutely free 
and I'm happy to do a little 15 minute consultation with you with the results of that if you want some help in interpreting and understanding what it's saying. And so on our website, if you go to the article section, you'll find an article that's entitled, What's Your Stress Type? And from there, there's a little link to the download for the, um, for the questionnaire. You can fill it out, you can email it to me, and then make a time to, you know, to talk about it, go over those results, and, and you might find it useful for you. Um, I find that sort of uh, mechanism, that questionnaire like that, really useful because it allows us to quantify things. And so there are questions on there that you may not relate to stress or how your body's responding to stress. Um, and this questionnaire sort of magically does it for you by asking the questions and getting a score of, you know, zero, one, two, or three in a, in a particular section or in response, you know, meaning never happens to the other extreme, always happens. Um, and it's not just things that you would normally associate with stress. And that's why I think it's important. Like, for instance, your hormonal balance, because here's a little secret for you. Do you know what your body uses to make cortisol? It uses progesterone. And so if you are a woman and you are um, supposed to have a certain balance between estrogen and progesterone and you are constantly under stress, what that means is you're constantly lowering your progesterone levels which then causes a hormonal imbalance, which can lead to all sorts of problems, including, you know, typical PMS sort of symptoms or, you know, bad uh, perimenopausal or postmenopausal uh, symptoms. Also, problems getting pregnant. When you're under stress, you need progesterone to be able to become pregnant and maintain a pregnancy. And when you're under stress and your progesterone levels drop in certain susceptible women, that is enough to make it so that you actually cannot conceive or, uh, or maintain a pregnancy. And um, I don't know if anyone else has ever heard of this happening. It's a fairly common uh, experience that a couple is trying to get pregnant and they can't. And they end up adopting. And then the stress of trying to get pregnant is away. And then they end up becoming pregnant on their own. That actually happened to my best friend growing up. His, uh, you know, his oldest sister is adopted, and then once they adopted her, he was conceived and, and you know, born normally. And so, and that's related to stress and, and progesterone levels being low. Let's see, Monica is asking me a question, and that is, uh, what's the website address? So it's right there on the screen. It's well, <clears throat> excuse me, wellbeinggps.com. Wellbeinggps, like your GPS system, .com, your navigation tool to being well. Thanks for that question, Monica. All right, so let's move on. So what about tonifying the adrenals? What about putting some attention to the adrenals or getting your adrenals to uh, act more appropriately and or recover from stressful situations? So there's, um, there's effects in a lot of different areas. And so I'm going to go through all of them. Number one, diet. One of the worst things that you can do for your adrenals is having grains as a staple in your diet. Process and refine carbs. And the result of consuming them, which are sugar spikes, is detrimental to the body and especially the adrenals and especially early in the morning. And so the, what do we typically eat for breakfast? Grain-based foods. I'm not sure how that started or why that started. You know, the, the conspiracy theorist in me wants to say that it was General Mills that started that whole trend, you know, once upon a time. But um, you... It will help your adrenals and your stress response if you concentrate more on proteins and fats for breakfast as opposed to grain-based carbohydrates. Um, even a, a breakfast of fruit may be too much sugar in the morning. Vegetables are fine. Uh, green drinks are fine. Protein shakes are fine. For me, optimal breakfast, two egg omelet with veggies and whatever veggies you want, tomatoes, mushrooms, asparagus, broccoli, you know, we do it all. Sometimes we even put another protein in there like salmon or whatever. That would be the best uh, breakfast for you. Um, and then cutting down on grain-based foods later in the day will also be important. If you do have to have grain-based foods, and I'm a big proponent of really trying to remove those grains from your diet. And if you want more information about that, one of the webinars on my website, if you just go to the archives, you'll find it. 
talks about living grain free and and talking about how to you know over a, a month um, how to test yourself to you know by getting off of grains and seeing what happens and how your body works sort of challenging people to do that I would you I would encourage you to experience that once in your life if you've never experienced it if what I'm saying sounds like it is another language and you're having that knee-jerk reaction that's saying what no way. Grains are great for us. Everybody says so. Well, number one, not everybody says so, including yours truly. And number two, you're, it's even more important for you to try it just to get a different experience. I always tell people I am not a fan of, um, of just accepting information as truth. And I want you to have that from me, and I want you to have that from your doctors and from our government. I'm a big fan of understanding the ramifications of your decisions. And for many of us, we decide, even though it's unconscious, we decide to have grains as a staple in our diet. And what I would like for everyone to do is to get off of those grains for a period of time to experience what's that, what that's like, and then you can decide uh, what's best for you. And Far and away, almost everybody that does this experiment finds that they lose weight, they lose fat. That's if they need to. So I'll say they normalize weight and fat, but most of us need to lose it. Um, sleep is better. Mood is better. Hormones are better. Um, all sorts of things improve. Digestion, elimination, joints feel better, brain function, focus, concentration, memory. All of those things improve in a period of two months. And so if you have that experience, you do that, and all of a sudden those things change. And, oh, by the way, you know, your kids like you more and you like your kids more, your spouse or your boss or whatever. Then if you say to me, you know what, pizza's more important to me, I'd understand that. But at least you would understand the ramifications of eating that pizza and how it's really affecting other things as well. Let's see. I've got a couple questions here. Um, <clears throat> There's an article that somebody wrote in from the Smithsonian Magazine that says, uh, why do we eat cereal for breakfast and other questions about American meals answered? So, all right, that's cool. I'll check that out. Thank you for that, Brandy. I appreciate it. And then a question from uh, Hader is that, uh, does corn and rice fall under grains? Yes. wonder if you're talking about gluten versus all grains. I'm talking about all grains. And so the grains that are gluten-containing are wheat, oat, rye, kamut, spelt, and barley, but I'm also talking about rice and corn and quinoa. Um, anything that's grain based. And again, don't think of this as a lifetime sentence. Just think of it as an experiment to see what, uh, how things could be different. I got a question from Deb and that says, do you include things like quinoa and grains? So, uh, yes, I do. I've been, I've had people argue with me and tell me that quinoa is a, you know, it's a, a seed, not a grain. I'm not sure what the technical difference is, but, uh, I do believe that um, the issue with all of these grain-based foods is a, a sugar spike that happens as a result of them, and I think that that happens from quinoa as well. And so if you're going to do the experiment, do it all the way. Jump in the deep end. Get all of those grains out of your diet just for a period of time, not a lifetime sentence, and then you can decide whether it's worth avoiding those things for you. But I'm telling you, just like I said about how genetically we are not geared to be exposed to chronic stress, well, genetically, it is a new phenomenon that we have had grains as a staple in our diet. For the vast majority of time that we've been on this planet as a species, that's a new phenomenon, and we have not been doing it long enough genetically for us to uh, make changes to thrive under those conditions. And if I were to point to one uh, issue that is more responsible than anything else for the amount of chronic disease that we have in this country, it's because of our grain-based diets. Um, okay, exercise also plays a role, but understand that it's a double-edged sword. If you are an exerciser, that's great. You should be. And it also is a stress to the body. It, it's what we may call a positive stress or a good stress, but it also can go too far as well. There are those of us who exercise and don't give us enough time, give ourselves enough time to recover properly and or don't do things to help keep our adrenals working the way they should. So exercise is also the other side of the coin that for many of us, exercise is our way of working off that excess energy. It's a way of de-stressing. You know, you, you have a hard day at work and you come home and you jump on the treadmill and it helps relax you. That's a much healthier way to do it than, you know, looking for a glass of wine or, or um, something else, substance or activity that will help numb us from feeling something that's uncomfortable to feel. 
I got to go back for a second to the diet. One thing I didn't mention is caffeine. And you have to understand that the reason we like caffeine and, ca and caffeine containing foods is that we get a little adrenal bump from that. And so we get that little bump of energy. But what we're not realizing with each one of those bumps is that our baseline of, you know, our starting point of energy keeps going down and down and down. So the way I explain it is, is that caffeine is a loan shark on energy. You get energy, but the interest you have to pay is more than the government would allow. I don't even know if that's valid anymore. I don't know if the government doesn't, uh, if, if the government still controls, uh, excuse me, interest rates on things. Anyways, um, you get the idea. And so if you, uh, and that's, this is why, you know, the caffeine thing starts with one cup of coffee in the morning and then a two cup and then it's another cup in the afternoon. And that's why that tendency happens because we're, depleting ourselves more and more when we use that. Uh, Deb says it's the tea tax. And yeah, right. Um, and, you know, tea, black tea has a lot of caffeine in it as well. We have a tendency to drink less of it, but it does have a lot of caffeine. Green tea is, is, uh, is healthier for you in that regard. Herbal teas don't have any. Um, and I would, I would make the contention that for a lot of us, those addictions, the coffee and tea thing in the morning are also about self-care. Because, and I know I experienced this, it's a ritual, you know, and it's a ritual that um, involves uh, a heat and an aroma and a preparation and it makes us feel good. And so, you know, if you are a coffee person, then what you can do is substitute a ritual with a different self-care ritual that will also help you feel good. And so maybe it's uh, an herbal tea where there's still a preparation and a warmth and an aroma and a process that doesn't contain the, the caffeine. And I'm a big fan, especially if we have stress issues of getting off of caffeine completely. And so that also means chocolate and that other stuff. Um, however, please, if you are on caffeine and you're going to get off of it, please do it gradually. Because if not, you know, you're going to get a bad headache and you're going to call me and you're going to say nasty things to me. You're going to think nasty things about me. And, and I certainly don't want that. And so what you have to do is uh, do it gradually. So how, whatever amount of coffee or caffeine containing, you know, drinks you drink right now, cut that consumption in half every week, but do it in the same amount of exposures. And so um, if you drink three cups of coffee a day, I don't want you to go to one and a half cups. I want you to go to a half cup three times a day so that you still get exposure to less and less caffeine, but at the same time. Um, and then uh, you can also start to substitute in, you know, decaf products, some of, the, some of the solvents that are used in the industry to decaffeinate things aren't so healthy for you. And so make sure it's, a, you know, it's an organic one that is using solvents that isn't bad for you. And so, um, uh, so that's the caffeine thing. Sorry, I had to go back to that. Okay. Uh, Nancy is saying, I, I am trying to be grain-free as much as I can. Learn from your previous webinars. I also heard, quote, that if you are going to eat grains, you should eat in the morning so you have all day to burn them off. Can you clarify, if you eat grains, is there a better time during the day or does it matter? Well, actually for adrenal function, it's better to not have the grains earlier in the evening. And because grains have a tendency to cause that spike and then crash in blood sugar, which then affects energy, if you have to eat grains, I would rather see you do them uh, for your evening meal because it may play a role with helping you sleep <clears throat> and not get drowsy during the day, which we're trying to avoid. So hopefully that uh, another, let's see, another grain question. How about potatoes? Potatoes are not grains. They're starches and starches are okay. Although I would prefer to see them in moderation. Um, and so, you know, if you are going to eat potatoes, um, Number one, eat potato. If you're eating French fries, they probably have sugar added to them or you're dipping them in, um, in uh, ketchup, which also has sugar in it. And so you're sort of uh, you know, getting a worse effect there and have moderate amounts of it. So you know, a half of a medium potato would be okay, especially in an evening meal. I would try to uh, avoid doing that for early day meals. Okay. I want to talk about sleep for a second because this is also really, really important. And what we're finding out in medicine and what you're going to see from your doctor in days to come is more and more respect for and more and more understanding of not getting proper sleep and its effect on our health, including blood pressure and blood sugar. And so more and more doctors are going to doing sleep studies with their patients to see if they have what's known as sleep apnea, meaning that 
you're not oxygenating properly while you're sleeping. Now, this can happen for a load of reasons. Some of them are just physiologic. Some of them are being overweight. Some of them are having dairy in the, in the diet, which causes a lot of upper respiratory congestion. And more and more people are starting to use these contraptions, these CPAP machines, which force you to oxygenate properly while you're sleeping. Um, but what we're finding in medicine is that folks that do not oxygenate properly um, have a tendency to have higher blood pressure and higher blood sugars, especially in the morning. And this is confounding to people that are trying to control these things. And so you get uh, someone that happens to be diabetic and they, you know, eat all the right diet and they control their sugars and maybe even are on medicines. And yet when they wake up in the morning, their blood sugars are elevated and it doesn't seem to make any sense because they haven't eaten since the, you know, the night before, they shouldn't be elevated. And it's because it is tremendously stressful to the body when you are not oxygenating properly. And when you say stress and the body and adrenal output as a result of that stress, remember, elevation of blood pressure, elevation of blood sugar. And so it's really important to make sure that you get proper sleep. Another webinar that I did, again, on the website is all about sleep and getting proper sleep and, the, and, you know, and supplements and nutrients that you can do that you can take to, be help, to help you with that and, and what quality sleep is and when you're supposed to get that sleep and, and all that sort of stuff. Here's one clue that, um, you know, that this may be an issue, and that is if you're not dreaming, that's an indication of not getting into the deeper levels of sleep. And if you're a snorer, if anyone's ever told you you're a snorer, even though you don't want to believe it, maybe even you women out there, that is another indication of not uh, oxygenating properly, and it's important to try to address it. So I would encourage you to evaluate that for yourself and um, you know, try to make changes if you can. All right, and then the bottom thing on there says supplements. And so I want to talk about some important nutrients uh, that can be helpful for you. So number one, vitamin D in fish oil is really, really important. And the reason that it's important is because of the role that these guys play in uh, genetic expression. Both of these nutrients, vitamin D and healthy fats, fish oil, uh, play a very important role with your genes expressing themselves in a proper way. Fish oil plays an additional role in, one, cutting down on inflammation, um, which is an underpinning of a lot of diseases, and two, helping cells communicate with each other appropriately. Some of our stress response and the physiological uh, results of stress and the biochemical response we have, some of that happens because cells aren't talking to each other the way they're supposed to. Miscommunication or lack of communication, and fish oil will look to help that. And it's, it's really, really important to understand that. Additionally, we had talked about sleep, Lots of people have issues with allergies, especially as they sleep, that contribute to not oxygenating properly. And fish oil is anti-inflammatory. It helps cut down on the reaction that you might have to something that you may have an allergy to. Um, nutrients for thyroid function, as we talked about, iodine, selenium, zinc, and E all play an important role with thyroid being able to, to function the way it's supposed to. And the B vitamins play a very important role with the body's ability to recover from our, uh, our activities and our stresses. And we don't get enough of the B vitamins in our diet. And so, but there's a whole other category of nutrients which are called adaptogens. Oops, it looks like I missed, um, I missed a slide here in my presentation. Sorry about that. So I'm going to go over that. There's a group of herbs that are known as adaptogens. And what that means is they help adapt your body to stress. And in essence, in a nonspecific way, they're tonifying to the adrenals. Now, they have different effects for different people. And this is where knowing what your, um, what your stress type is is really, really important. Because if you are an under-responder, then you want herbs and nutrients that are um, lifting energy-wise and uh, stimulating, like licorice or ginseng. But if we gave licorice or ginseng to somebody that was an over-responder, we'd likely make their brain race more and maybe even make their anxiety levels worse. It'd be like taking a, um, you know, someone that has uh, uh, too much energy and then giving them uh, caffeine. And the same is true of the opposite. There are herbs that are calming, like uh, rhodiola or arctic root or ashwagandha. 
And those are good for the over responders because it'll calm that down. But if you gave that to an under responder, you're going to make them less able to respond. And so there's different formulas for different stress types. And that's where, um, you know, taking advantage of having a quick conversation with me and maybe even filling out that questionnaire would be helpful for you. And then you can, you know, use the appropriate herbal support to help you as you go through um, learning to interact with your environment in a different way, which I'm about to talk about. And so just to tell you a couple of specific formulas. And so my favorite formula for over responders is called cortisol calm. And it's a combination of an amino acid, which is called L-theanine, which is the precursor to GABA, which is the brain chemical that is the brakes on the runaway thoughts. It is the brakes on the train of the runaway thoughts. And so if you were to take uh, a Xanax or a Valium, that would raise your GABA levels, but it would do that in a monkeying with brain chemistry way. Whereas you can do it from the nutritional approach by using a simple amino acid called L-theanine, and that will raise your GABA levels. And so this cortisol calm has L-theanine plus herbs, ashwagandha and uh, rhodiola rosea or arctic root, which are calming. And so if you are an over-responder, taking this uh, in the morning and taking it in the evening or at bedtime will help calm things down for you. Um, additionally, if you are prone to um, uh, waking up in the middle of the night worrying about things, meaning that you're getting a cortisol spike in the middle of the night, there's another ingredient which is called phosphatidylserine and a very specific product called Serifos which helps fight against that tendency. And so I'll either use cortisol calm alone or in combination with the Serifos for, at bedtime for people that you know are having that problem. Uh, how do you spell that? Two people uh, asked me that. So it's cortisol, C-O-R-T-I-S-O-L, and then calm, like calming, C-A-L-M. It's made by a company called Pure Encapsulations. Pure Encapsulations is one of the professional companies that only makes their products available to health professionals. Um, I absolutely love that product. I take it myself. I use it with a lot of patients and we get really nice results with it. Um, you can get that product uh, through me. We do not have it on our website and that's because that company does not allow us to discount online, but we do discount it. So if you would like that product, you can call the office and we'll be happy to send it to you. We don't charge anything for shipping and we sell it for 20% less than the suggested retail. Terry's asking, what about the uh, previous one for overachievers? Okay, so I was talking about an amino acid, which is called L-theanine, T-H-E-A-N-I-N-E. -E. That is part of the formula of cortisol calm, and sometimes I have people take L-theanine by itself as well. And there's a specific brand you wanna look for, it's called Sun-theanine, and a lot of companies make it, and again, you know, we have it in uh, lots of various forms. For the under responders that need more um, energy and need more wherewithal to be able to respond to stressful things, we use a product that's called Power Adapt by a company called Natura, N-A-T-U-R-A. And again, Power Adapt is, is made by one of those companies that only makes their products available to health professionals. But this one is really good for energizing. And so this is one that I will use for people that are really sluggish in the morning, that have a hard time recovering from their uh, exertions and exercises. And I have a tendency to use it earlier in the day because it can be a little bit energizing. Um, same company, Natura, makes a product which is called Vital Adapt, which is more of a general tonic that anybody could take any time during the day, which is also really good for that. Diane is asking, if you are on antidepressants, should you use any of these? Um, the answer is that there is no interaction with these and specific antidepressants. There can be with other formulas, and that's where I would want to talk to somebody just to see what they're on, how long they've been on it, and help manage things appropriately. Understand that antidepressants are not fixing problems. That's one of those medicines that's just turning down the volume on your body talking to you with this you know, uh, symptom that we call depression. I'm not making a value judgment about that. I'm not saying you shouldn't be on a medicine like that, but I am saying that we should recognize that that's not fixing a problem. 
and we should endeavor to make the need for that antidepressant not be there anymore. That sometimes is a difficulty in medicine because usually the thought is, is that once you go on that medicine, you're probably going to be on it. And, um, and you know, you're going to have to do the hard work and you're going to convince your doctor that, you know, you don't want to be on that for the rest of your life if that's, if that's your choice. All right, so let's talk about learning to interact with your environment uh, in a different way. And so here's, a, um, here's an illustration I want to give you, all right? I want you to imagine that we have a roller coaster, and we have two people that are going to go on that ride. One of them, they love it. It's exhilarating. So while they're waiting in line before they go on the, on the ride, their heart rate and their blood pressure goes up in anticipation. They're, they're actually creating endorphins, you know, those good chemicals that make you feel good. And they go on that ride, and it's a thrill. And again, blood pressure and heart rate are up. And they come off that ride, and they're just exhilarated. And it's like, wow, that was great. And then all those things come back to normal. And then the second person going on that roller coaster, for them, it's a white knuckle experience. It scares them. And they, you know, they're contemplating their death. And so while they're waiting in line for the, um, for the ride, they're thinking about how they're going to die on that ride. And they're not creating endorphins. They're creating cortisol, hormones of stress. Heart rate, blood pressure go up. They go on that ride. And it scares them to get off that ride. They remember when they came close to death and heart rate and blood pressure stay up. The interesting thing and the thing to remember about this illustration is that that roller coaster ride was the same for both of those people. It is not the roller coaster. It's how you relate to it. So the roller coaster of your life, you can learn to relate to it differently. And I am telling you that I sit down with people every day. And they tell me it's their husbands or wives or parents or kids or bosses. And then they go out and they get new husbands and wives and parents and kids and bosses. And it's the same. And it's because it's not that. It's how you're responding to that. And that's what we have to learn differently. And if you can learn to do that differently, your body will respond differently. And things that happen will stop being interpreted as life-threatening, which will then stop that very complicated cascade of biochemical events that leads to many of the problems that we have as we go along. Hopefully that makes sense to people. So I want to propose an idea for you. And that is that, wait, I'm going to give you a different illustration. This is a, this is an old Chinese proverb, I think. And so once you imagine this guy is rowing his boat upstream against the stream and it's hard work and he's going up the stream and he goes around a corner and a guy in a boat coming the other way bumps into him and it you know, slows his progress and it stops his momentum and he is mad. And he stands up on the boat and he yells at him and then uh, you know, sits down and starts rowing again. And he's rowing again and he goes around another corner and a boat hits into him again. And he stands up about to yell and then he realizes that there's nobody in the boat. It just came loose from its moorings. So he shrugs his shoulders, he sits down and he goes about his way. So when things happen to us in our lives that we have a tendency to blame people for, we can do the opposite. We can just assume that the boat is empty. And if you do that, then the, the, the strife that comes with it, and again, that biochemical response that happens with that strife will just dissipate as well. So the other thing is that you can just uh, assume that the boat is empty. Um, <clears throat> so it says you have everything that you need. And so um, this is part of uh, learning to interact with your environment differently and see things in a different way. And that is to understand that you do have everything that you need. That um, you're clothed, you're, you have food, you, you know, all the other stuff becomes little stuff when you really realize that you do have everything you need. And the, the universe is just one big reflecting pool. And so what you put out there, energy, is what reflects back to you. And so when you... Um, when you keep telling the, uh, the, the world, the uh, God, or you, the universe, um, what you need, the universe just keeps shaking its head and says, yes, that's what you need. But when you tell the universe you have everything that you need, the universe works differently. And I think this is why originally we're told to you know, pray with appreciation for what we have instead of asking for things. Um, let's see. I've got a question here. It says, do you uh, supplement – do the supplements you mentioned work for both acute and chronic? Yes. Um, uh, yes. Now, oftentimes acute stress turns into chronic stress for us, the way we live today. But yes, these herbs or nutrients can be used for episodes of stress. If something stressful is coming up or st something stressful is being, um, experienced. So thank you for that question. 
All right, so I'm going to give you a quick five-minute meditation method, and this is really, really simple. Part of the reason why we have such a problem with meditation in this country is because um, it's sort of foreign to our culture. If you go to other cultures, it's something that they just sort of grow up with, the idea. But here, many of us grow up with the idea that idle time is wasted time, and that goes really deep in our psyches. And so the easiest way for us to do this is to dedicate five minutes every day to this technique. And just say to yourself, you're going to do it every day. On the days that you feel least like doing it, that's when you're going to benefit the most. I promise you. So if for two weeks you just say, come hell or high water, I'm going to do this five minutes every morning. By the end of that two weeks, it will have become your practice and you'll want it to expand and you will love the way it feels after you do that. And so what I want you to do is sit down and um, get comfortable. You do not have to sit on the floor. You do not have to wrap your legs into a pretzel. You want to be comfortable here. And you want to just close your eyes and breathe in and out. You do not want to do this while you're laying down because you'll fall back asleep. There's a good clue. You can do this at night if you're having a problem getting to sleep and it'll help you. But in the morning, you want to sit up in a chair, on the floor, whatever's comfortable, and close your eyes and breathe in and out through your nose and count to yourself. In, out, one. And then you're going to do it again. In, out, two. In, out, three. In, out, four. And then you're going to go back to one. Now, the idea here is to quiet your mind of thoughts. And I promise you that your mind and the thoughts on your mind in your mind are constant. And it's like the highway at the worst rush hour you've ever experienced. And every thought is a car and just keeps going, going, going. Now, you can't stop that. If I say to you, hey, stop that, you, we actually just added another car to the highway. But what you can do is agree to not get in a car and go for a ride. So here's an example. You sit down and you say, all right, I'm going to do this. And you breathe in, out, one. Before you even get to two, here comes the first thought. And I'll, I'll tell you what that thought is just so you know. This is what's going to happen. You go, oh, that Brian, what an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So here's what you do. You don't get in that car and go for a ride. Just say, okay, he's an idiot. That's a judgment. I'm going to go back to my breathing. In, out, one. In, out. Before you get to two again, here comes the next thought. And that is, my back's kind of uncomfortable here. Here's an, ex here's an example of getting in a car and going for a ride. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable. I'm going to go get a pillow and put it behind me, and then I'm going to start over again. Don't do that. Just say, okay, my, my back's uncomfortable. Your body will play all sorts of tricks. Your mind will play all sorts of tricks to make you pay attention to it. But I promise you, as you start to remove cars from that highway, that's where the magic happens. The magic happens in the space between the thoughts. And as you get practiced with this, you'll go in, out, one, in, out, two. You'll be able to get through three, four, and then you'll get through a couple cycles. And before you know it, five minutes will be gone. Don't worry about a clock. Don't set an alarm. Don't say to yourself, okay, I'm going to set you know, my egg timer for five minutes and then I'm going to stop. Just set the intention of doing it for five minutes. And when you open your eyes, it's only been three minutes. Say, okay, that was three minutes. The next time it'll be six minutes. And before you know it, you will be a practiced meditator. And this will make the hugest difference in your day, how everything fits in the universe, and especially how your adrenals uh, react to things. And so I would encourage you, I would challenge you to do this every morning for five minutes. And in fact, I will challenge myself to do the same thing. And all of us can do it together. And we'll raise the consciousness of the universe while we're doing it. That sounds good. So if you have any questions, now's a great time to type them in. Um, while you're doing that, I put up there that, again, on our archives, on our website, we have a ton of these different um, webinars that I've done on all sorts of topics like cholesterol or osteoporosis or what I call the essential six, the really important nutrients for everybody to take um, to age more gracefully. There's uh, webinars about menopause and sleep and depression and uh, webinars about specific nutrients like vitamin D or probiotics or fish oil. And so lots of good information there. I would encourage you to, um, to get in touch with me. Again, you can do it right through the website, wellbeinggps.com. Or if you want to call me, just go to the website and you will see, um, you will see uh, uh, our toll-free number. You are welcome to call anytime. And now some questions are coming in. So, okay, another diet question. We cook a lot at home and lentils is a big one we use. Grain, good or bad? Um, Lentils is, I do not think it's technically a, a grain. I think it's more of a, a, a legume. Um, and I would say it's okay to use if you're using it in moderation. All right. Uh, do you, here's another question. Do you suggest DHEA for adrenal fatigue? It can be helpful. DHEA is one of the hormones that the adrenal makes. And when we're under stress, the adrenals make it less. I am a bigger fan of trying to return adrenal function to normal instead of trying to add hormones in from the outside world. 
if we have to do that, DHEA is a good one. I like to verify by blood level that you know DHEA levels are low. Um, that's part of that uh, saliva test that we do sometimes. But um, uh, it's not usually my first thing. When we use proper adrenal support and learning to interact with the environment in a different way, DHEA levels go up normally the way they're supposed to. Thanks for that question. And here's one from Patricia for waking up in the middle of the night. Seraphos, uh, you got it right phonetically, but it's actually spelled S-E-R-I-P-H-O-S, Seraphos. And that, that stands for uh, phosphatidylserine and a very specific form of that. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, how do we contact you with completed questionnaire? So you download the questionnaire. It'll come to you as a, uh, um, as a spreadsheet. You'll be able to put the answers right in there, save it, email it back to me, um, and then uh, call me or call my office. And if you don't speak to me, you can speak to Michael and say, hey, I was on the webinar and Brian promised me that, uh, you know, he would talk to me for a few minutes about the results of this and he'll get you on my schedule so that I have time to, you know, to sit down and talk to you about that on the phone. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. Thank you for that. And Patricia, you're very welcome. I hope everybody enjoyed this. I really do um, uh, honor your willingness to spend some time with me. I think the next webinar that we have scheduled is going to be in August, and it's going to be about inflammation and the underpinning of every chronic disease out there and what we should be doing and why we have a tendency towards inflammation and all that stuff. And so stay in touch, you know, look at the, the website, go to the website and sign up for our newsletter and then you'll get notification about all this kind of stuff. And I really do appreciate it, everybody. I hope you have a great day.